Good morning, church. Welcome to worship, <clears throat> excuse me, on this beautiful June morning, um, but it's supposed to be quite hot throughout the day, so I hope you will be where you need to be to remain cool throughout it, but to still enjoy this Lord's Day in spite of the heat. In your order of worship is the Chronicle. It has their announcements and information for you about what's going on in the church for the coming week. Um, I do want to point out a couple things. The youth group is leaving for Caswell tomorrow, and they will be at youth camp through the 28th. The theme is listed on the back of the uh, insert, the, the um, chronicle, so I invite you perhaps to sit in that theme this week as you pray for Heather and Natalie and Maggie and Delaney, that they might have um, the best spiritual formation experience at Camp Caswell this week. Also, perhaps many of you know that we have a, a mission project we are currently doing, which is to put have bags for Odom Children's Home children to help them take things they need to the beach. You see on the back of the Chronicle, there's a list there of what's already in the bags and a discussion, I mean, and more information about what else can be included in those bags. So if you would like to add something yourself, um, they're in the parlor, and we need those in those bags by July 7. So thank you for contributing to that. In terms of how we might pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm always cautious about naming names because I've, I'm not sure, sometimes I'm not sure if someone wants their name to be made public. But I think I'm okay with these three. So please remember Hilda Jarman, Julia Williams, and Lewis Evans. And throughout the service, as you have the moments, would you pray for them? And I'm sure there are others that come to mind, and would you offer your prayer for them as well? Welcome to worship. It feels like madness to stand before the giant with nothing but faith and a few small stones. It seems insane to believe that anything but brute force can match the challenge of the powerful. But in the stillness, a different voice whispers, speaking of crosses and empty tombs, of justice and God's concern for the weak. In the stillness, Fear and insecurity can be heard in the bellowing of the bullies. And in the stillness, the temptation in each of us to cling to our power at all costs becomes clear and transparent. And so we find ourselves once again in prayer, Jesus, that the gentle persuasion of your cross may change how we power in our world, that the strong and wealthy may find life in sharing and empowering, and that we each, in our own small way, may remember that our storms are, are most often stilled when we allow your authority to lead us and your justice to teach us how to live. Please join me in our invocation. Center us, O oh God, to worship you this day. Remove our needless armor be our stronghold, grant us our calm, give us joyful hearts and ready minds that we may open to your grace through Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, 
Our gospel lesson is from the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Let us hear the word of the Lord. When evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's go over to the other side of the lake. They left the crowd behind, and they took him along in a boat, just as he was. There were other boats with him. A wild storm came up. Jesus crashed over the boat. It was about to sink. Jesus was in the back, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke up, woke him up. They said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up and ordered the wind to stop. He said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Don't you have any faith in God? They were terrified. They asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Praise to you, O Christ. Together, let us offer our prayer of confession. Lord God of all creation, we come to you from our storm tossed lives to seek your peace. We come to you with our questions and uncertainties, our worries and anxieties. We come to you from our joy and our happiness. Each emotion, a kaleidoscope of our feeling in life's changing patterns. More than all of that, we come to you because of what you have done for us in the love of Christ, who bought our freedom by his sacrifice on the cross and showed us new life in his resurrection. We bless you for the love which has no dimension of length breadth, width, or height. We come to you knowing that sometimes we have received your grace in vain. We have not relied on your word or your wisdom. We have not shown any concern or compassion when we should have. We have not loved our neighbor as we love ourselves. We have remained silent when we should have spoken and spoken when we should have been silent. We seize this moment to ask you for yet another chance of hearing you say to us, 
your sins are forgiven. May the mark of that forgiveness be your grace in us as we respond with grace and gratitude to your love. Eternal God, we ask that you accept our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray that from the grace we have received, what we say and what we do will enable those around us to glimpse the life of your Son, who calmed the storm with words which still echo down the centuries. Peace, be still. In the name of the Prince of Peace, we pray. Amen. Please join me in our assurance of forgiveness with calming words, with a peaceful spirit, with overflowing love and hope. Our God forgives us and fills us with peace. Our God affirms us for who we are, those whose brokenness is made whole, whose sin is forgiven, whose lives overflow with peace. Thanks be to God. us hear from the word Ephesians 6 10 through 17 finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The grass 
withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Let us pray together. Our always listening God, we come to you at this moment with the names of family members, friends, and co-workers who are facing varied challenges. Some are struggling with physical health problems. For others, it's mental health. <clears throat> Some are in financial distress. Others are journeying through deep grief. Some are experiencing a crisis of faith. Others are struggling with their marriages or other relationships. For those in these circumstances and more, we now offer our silent prayers. God, our helper, hear our prayer. We pray that all the persons who were prayed for and we ourselves will strive to live each day dressed in the full armor of God, which will equip them and us to withstand life's challenges. May the belt of truth be firmly in place. May the breastplate of righteousness shield us from evil. May our feet be firmly planted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. May the shield of faith be strong enough to withstand the questions and doubts. May the helmet of salvation protect our minds. And may the sword of the Spirit, God's holy word, be read and meditated upon and memorized so, so that it will ever be accessible in our minds and in our hearts. This we pray in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Pray with me, please. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful, warm Sunday morning and for bringing us to this special house of worship today. As we place our tithes and offerings on the altar, giving back to you what is yours, we pray that these offerings will be used to further the gospel of our Lord here in Waitsboro, First Baptist Church. North Carolina, the USA, and throughout the world. We offer these offerings in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Good morning. So, everybody may notice that we all have something with us today. How many of you are enjoying summer so far? We're about a month in for us in Anson County, aren't we? Okay, so today I asked everybody to bring with them one thing that's something they are excited about playing with or doing this summer. So, Merritt, what do you have? You go, say it in the microphone. A dragon. Your dragon. Okay, who's up next? Holden, come on. Show us what you've got. A book. A book. What book is it? Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Okay. Come tell us what you're excited about for the summer. Baseball. Baseball. Cool. Brandon, what do you have? Yarn. Yarn. Are you going to crochet? Cool. Okay. Ray, what about you, big girl? Camping. You're going to go camping. Oh, fun. All right, Josh, what do you have for us? It's a book, and it's about a beach. Are you going to the beach? Can I want to do horse riding lessons? Very nice. Horse riding lessons. Okay. What kind of animal is it? What have you got, big girl? A seashell bag. A seashell bag. Are you going to collect seashells? Awesome. Okay. So, as you can tell, we are all going to have a very fun summer. Everybody has picked out something special that they're going to do, right? So, the cool thing is that God is with us when we're doing all of those super fun things that we have planned this summer. So we know God is with us at church, right? Because, you know, we're here. But also, God is with us during the school year, when we're at school, and this summer, as we all have lots of fun. Um, So I want you all to have a super-duper good summer. Later in the summer, I'm going to come back up and do another children's sermon, and I'm going to have you give us some updates on all the fun you've had. Okay? All right, so let's pray. Dear God, Thank you for being with us during the school year, and thank you for being with us during the summer. Please let us proceed through the summer with kindness and fairness. Help us to be good disciples. Dear Lord, please let our summers be as much fun as we hope they will be. Please let them be safe. Please let us be loving throughout. Dear God, be with all of the parents here in the room as we go through summer. Dear God, please help us all change our pace this summer. Slow down. Enjoy the quiet of summer. Dear God, please let us all learn something new and be with us through summer vacations here at church and doing all of the fun things we plan to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. A response. It's still not, we still haven't quite got it down yet. Um, This is an older response I understand that y'all used to do and I love it. So um, here's how it goes. I say, as we continue worshiping, and then the congregation says to you children, and you are to say to all of them, may God be with you here. Can you say that with me? May God be with you here. Well done. You can go now. The Philistines gathered their armies for war. The Philistines had a champion fighter from Gath named Goliath. He was about nine feet four inches tall. He came out of the Philistine camp with a bronze helmet on his head and a coat of bronze armor that weighed about 125 pounds. He wore bronze protectors on his legs and his spear was like a weaver's rod. His blade weighed about 15 pounds. The officer who carried his shield walked in front of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the the Israelite soldiers. Why have you taken positions for battle? I am a Philistine, and you are Saul's servants. Choose a man and send him to fight me. If he can fight and kill me, we will be your servants. 
but if I can kill him, you will be our servants. Today I stand and dare the army of Israel. Send one of your men to fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard the Philistines' words, they were very scared. Now David was the son of Jesse, an Ephrath Ephrathite from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons. In Saul's time, Jesse was an old man. His three oldest sons followed Saul to the, to the war. David was the youngest. Jesse's three oldest sons followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to Bethlehem, where he took care of his father's sheep. For 40 days, the Philistines came out every morning and evening and stood before the Israelite army. Jesse said to his son David, Take this half bushel of cooked grain to, and ten loaves of bread to your brothers at the camp. Also take ten pieces of cheese to the commander and your brothers. See how your brothers are and bring back some proof to show me that they are all right. Your brothers go with Saul and the army in the Valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the sheep with another shepherd. He took the food and left as Jesse had told him. When David arrived at the camp, the army was going out for their battle positions, shouting their war cry. The Israelites and Philistines were lining up their men to face each other in battle. David left the food with the man who kept the supplies and ran to the battle line to talk to his brothers. While he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out. He shouted things against Israel as usual, and David heard him. And David said to Saul, Don't let anyone be discouraged. I, your servant, will go and fight the Philistine. Saul answered, You can't go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy. Goliath has been a warrior since he was a young man. But David said to Saul, I, your servant, have been keeping my father's sheep. When a lion or a bear come and took a sheep from the flock, I would chase it. I would attack it and save the sheep from its mouth. When it attacked me, I caught it by its fur and hit it and killed it. I, your servant, have killed both a lion and a bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like them because he has spoken against the armies of the living God. The Lord who hath saved me from a lion and a bear will save me from the Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul put his own clothes on David. He put a bronze helmet on his head and dressed him in armor. David put on Saul's sword and tried to walk around, but he was not used to all the armor Saul had put on him. He said to Saul, I can't go in this because I'm not used to it. Then David took it all off. He took his stick in his hand and chose five smooth stones from a stream. He put them in his shepherd's bag and grabbed his sling. Then he went to meet the Philistine. At the same time, the Philistine was coming closer to David. The man who held his shield walked in front of him. When Goliath looked at David and saw that he was only a boy, tanned and handsome, he looked down at David with disgust. He said, Do you think I am a dog? that you come at me with a stick? He used his God's names to curse David. And he said to David, Come here, I'll feed your body to the birds of the air and the wild animals. But David said to him, You come to me using a sword and two spears, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, all-powerful, the God of the armies of Israel. You have spoken against him. Today the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will kill you and cut off your head. Sorry, Glenn. Today I will feed you the bodies of the Philistine soldiers to the birds of the air and the wild animals. Then all the world will know there is a God in Israel. Everyone gathered here will know the Lord does not need swords or spears to save people. The battle belongs to him, and he will hand it, you over to us. As Goliath came near to attack him, David ran quickly to meet him. He took a stone from his bag put it into his sling and slung it. The stone hit the Philistine and went deep into his forehead, and Goliath fell face down on the ground. 
So David defeated the Philistine with only a sling and a stone. This is the word of God for the people of God. For 10 years, from 2003 to 2013, television's The Learning Channel aired a makeover reality show called What Not to Wear. How many watched it? I love that show. It featured Clinton Kelly and Stacey London who helped people who were wardrobe, makeup, <clears throat> and hairstyle challenged. Participants were nominated by family members, friends, <clears throat> or co-workers. Those chosen received a surprised televised visit from Kelly in London, who offered them $5,000 toward a new wardrobe, new hairstyle, and makeup, as long as they followed Kelly in London's wardrobe rules. Participants were asked to box up their entire wardrobe and bring it with them to the Learning Channel studio. And once there, they modeled three of their favorite outfits for Kelly in London. The critique of those outfits was often painful to watch and it often stepped on my toes. There was a woman who had three children under the age of 10, and due to her hectic life, she had gotten into the habit of wearing baggy clothes, no makeup, and her hair set in a loose ponytail. There was a young woman who bleached her hair blonde, wore heavy makeup, and the clothing in all combined made her look like a painted doll and not a pretty one. There was a scientist who, because she wore a lab coat at work, paid little attention to her workday attire. Once the participants' outfits had been critiqued, Kelly and London would show them three outfits that they had put together that they thought was the best option based on the participant's body shape, height, and stature. With these outfits, Kelly and London explained the rules of clothes shopping, gave the participants the $5,000 credit card, and sent them shopping for a new wardrobe. And of course, the television cameras followed them. Kelly in London watched the participant shop and always arrived at the store during that crucial, cru crucial moment when the shopper became so confused and irritated and frustrated. Near the show's end, a reveal party was held at the participant's hometown. It was fun to watch the nominator the family, the friends, and the co-workers see for the first time their transformed participant. Episodes ended <clears throat> with a months later post-show visit to see if the participant was still following the rules for clothing, hairstyle, and makeup. Most did. The woman who looked like the painted doll she went right back to her old ways. In today's Old Testament reading, nested within this familiar story of David and Goliath is a what not to wear lesson. Did you catch it as you heard Margot and Glenn and Chance read it? Once David convinced Saul that he could and would fight the giant Philistine, Saul, wanting to protect David from harm, brought David his armor, Saul's armor. 
<clears throat> Saul, no, his armor. But David was a young boy, not a well-seasoned man like Saul. So beginning in verse 38, it reads like this. Saul put his own clothes on David. He put a bronze helmet on his head, dressed him in armor. David put on Saul's sword and tried to walk around, but he was not used to all the armor Saul had put on him. He said to Saul, I can't go in this because I'm not used to it. Then David took it all off. He took his stick in his hand and he chose five smooth stones and he put them in his shepherd's bag and grabbed his sling and then he went to meet the Philistine. It's quite possible that if David had been forced to wear Saul's armor, David would have been defeated and the future of the Israelites would be in question. As I was studying the Old Testament lesson today from 1 Samuel in preparation for worship, I was reminded of the verses that we heard from the New Testament book of Ephesians where we're encouraged to put on the full armor of God. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus as an encouragement to stand firm in their faith amid the world's evil. He used the metaphor of armor because both he and the people of the church at Ephesus were quite familiar with Roman government culture and how the Roman soldiers dressed for battle. Here's what writer Natalie Rigoli wrote about each of those pieces of armor. The belt of truth. A soldier is only ready for battle when he is girded with his belt. A Roman soldier's belt was made of metal and thick, heavy leather and was the carrying place for his sword. His belt held all the other pieces of his armor together. To be fitted with his belt meant he was ready to face action. Truth is the belt that holds the believer's armor together. And ultimate truth can be found in God's word and in the person of Jesus Christ. We must know this truth in order to protect ourselves against our own flesh, the world, and the father of lies. Truth grounds us and reminds us of our identity in Christ. Second, the breastplate of righteousness. The Roman soldier was always equipped with a breastplate. This piece of armor protected his vital organs in the heat of battle when he wasn't quick enough to stand up to his, with his shield. The breastplate was for the quick and unexpected advances of the enemy. As believers, we have no righteousness apart from that which has been given to us through Jesus Christ. Our breastplate is his righteousness. His righteousness, his righteousness will never fail. Though we have no righteousness of our own, we must still, by his power, choose to live right according to his life. Living a right life rooted in God's word is powerful in protecting our heart, killing our flesh, and defeating the enemy. Third, the sandals with the gospel of peace. Roman soldiers were fitted with sandals called caligae. Their sandals were made to help protect soldiers' feet during their long marches in battle. They had extremely thick soles and wrapped perfectly around their ankles in a way that protected them against blistering. Caligae also had spikes on the bottom to help them stand firm as they traveled. This helped them have 
a firm foundation. Believers also have a firm foundation in the gospel. As believers, we have peace in knowing we are secure in what Jesus has done for us. Fourth, the shield of faith. The Roman soldier's shield was a complex piece of armor. The shield was a soldier's primary defense weapon. It was made of impenetrable wood, leather, canvas, and metal and could be doused in water to extinguish the fiery arrows of the enemy. Faith is the shield of the believer. Trusting in God's power and protection is imperative in remaining steadfast. When the battle rages, we must remember that God works all things for good. He is always true to his promises. Fifth, the helmet of salvation. The soldier's head is one of the most vulnerable areas, of course. Without his helmet, one blow to the head would prove fatal. His helmet covered his entire head, the facial area, between the eyes. His armor would prove useless if he wasn't equipped with his helmet. The believer's helmet of salvation is the most crucial piece of armor for the Christian. Without the indwelling Holy Spirit, all other armor is useless. Salvation empowers believers to fight. It protects us in our weaknesses. Without salvation, there is no victory. And finally, six, the sword of the Spirit. All other pieces of the soldier's arsenal are defensive weapons, but not his sword. The sword, called a gladius, was a deadly weapon. In the hands of a skilled warrior, he could pierce through even the strongest armor. Our sword is the word of God, both the written and the incarnate word we know as Jesus Christ. Every other piece of armor protects us against attacks. With God's word, we are truly able to fight and defeat all enemies. Christ used scripture to defeat Satan when he was tempted in the desert. We must do the same. Our culture has such a strong influence on what we proverbially wear. In our 21st century world, our world teaches us that we must wear anger, distrust, disbelief, contempt, hate those who are different from us. Social media has provided a platform on which we can and do spew our anger, voice our passive aggressive complaints, and spread unsubstantiated rumors. This proverbial clothing is not God's intent for our wardrobe. Like David, we are to cast off the world's ill-fitting clothes. Be strong in the Lord, Paul writes, and put on the armor of God. We don't need a reality show makeover to teach us how to dress for our journey with Christ. Instead, let us make sure our belt of truth is firmly buckled, our breastplate of righteousness, the shield is locked in place, our feet are firmly planted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our shield of faith is strong and unyielding. Our helmet 
of salvation perfectly fits our minds. And our sword of the spirit, God's holy word, may it be read, meditated upon, and memorized so that it will be ever accessible in our minds and in our hearts. It is our tradition that at the close of a worship service, we always offer a time for any kind of response that you feel led to provide 
Perhaps God has been speaking you to you today as we have worshipped, and you want to become a member of this beautiful church family. You have chosen a right and good place to do that. Over the weekend, I was back home in Mahoskey for my father's 90th birthday, and I told several people, they were asking about you, and I told them, I said, one of their best spiritual gifts is hospitality. You are so welcoming. So if you are in the need of a church family, a welcoming place, this is it. There are more, but this is it. Come join us. Come join us. Perhaps you are already a follower of Jesus Christ. You are already a member, perhaps. This time of response is still for you. Ask yourself, what does God's Holy Spirit want you to take from this service today that will help you walk with Christ in the week ahead? Let's stand and sing and respond. I hope when you leave this place today, you may truthfully say it has been good to be in the house of the Lord. Hear now this benediction. May we spend as much time wondering what our proverbial wardrobe will be as we seek to follow Jesus Christ. We spend an awful lot of time choosing what we're going to wear physically. We need to spend more time concentrating on our spiritual wardrobe. Let's be like David, cast off what we don't need, and put on the full 
armor of God. Through Christ our Lord.